Hi guys, we are back again for Doctrine of Christ. Uh, this is uh, Christology. So Christology, Doctrine of Christ, that is super simple. Now you have another theology word you can add to your memory bank, uh, but get ready for some cognitive dissonance today. I don't know if you know that psychological term. It's like in music where you have a minor key. It just kind of, oh, it's going to be some tension we have to sit in. So it's, uh, we will not fast forward to solutions. Uh, we will just sit in that. So. so last week we talked about the Nicene Creed, which I misspelled in my slide last week. Um, so sorry about that. We learned that God the Father and God the Son are consubstantial with the father um, and that's the same substance the same essence here again i apologize for the spell check failing me um, on homeosis uh, spelled wrong as well so um, today we're going to look at another creed in addition to the nicene creed that helped clarify the boundaries of who jesus is uh, so the doctrine of christ very simply boiled down is Christ, uh, Jesus is fully God and fully man. Uh, and today we're going to dig into that more with some metaphysical reflections on Jesus' nature. So we're going to study his ontology, which is a big word that means the relation of the being, the person, the existence, the reality of someone. And we're going to look at it in space and time. So get ready. We're excited. Um, I want, so to, to kind of help us, I want you guys to envision uh, a balance board, okay? A ball on a board, and we are balancing on it, okay? This is the image that I want you guys to keep in mind as we, as we look at how people have kind of fallen off the board and gone from one side to another. We're going to try and find our equilibrium here. Um, another image I want you to think about is concrete. Um, when concrete is wet and poured out over time, it solidifies. The substance doesn't actually change, nothing is added to it, uh, but the experience of concrete is different before it dries. So time makes the experience of that concrete different. So keep those images in mind and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, add to them as we go. So Jesus was fully man. I'm not going to spend too much time on Jesus's humanity because scripture is really clear on that point. Um, it's only gotten fuzzy over the years as people have tried to unify his divinity and understand that in light of his humanity, that the excuses started being made for why Jesus wasn't really truly human. Uh, Matthew 13 relates to the story of Jesus's power and wisdom saying, the people were offended at him. Where did this man get these miraculous powers? Uh, isn't this the carpenter's son? So it's very obvious to the people that Jesus was around that he was a human. Um, next, we'll see some verses that talk about how Jesus experienced life in a very human way. So he ate, he slept, he got tired, you know, um, got hungry. But these are kind of some of the exact verses that we struggle with. We see that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. How did God grow? This is very confusing for us to understand. Did that change his human nature? This is where that idea of concrete begins to come into play. Uh, the verse says that Jesus grew in wisdom. So that doesn't mean that he learned new things. Um, he, it also says he grew in stature. So Jesus's nature did not change. He did not, like a baby is still a human, just as a fully grown man is still a human. This was the advancement of the growth of a person through time. Uh, so the process of growing, Jesus was just like concrete, the, the substance has not changed. Jesus is human from beginning to end, but the experience of that human is different with the passing of time. Uh, so instead of sloshy, stepping into a sloshy wet concrete, with the passing of time, concrete becomes hardened. So 
it's, we see that grew, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, that doesn't mean that he learned new things. It means that with the passage of time, he was proven those things. And so his actions continued to show and prove his obedience, his submission to the Father. The concrete is hardening over time. But Jesus has always been who he is, but as the infinite God put himself in time, that passage of time reveals it. So we experience and see Jesus different stages, even though he has always been the same. So Hebrews 2.17 is very explicit and clear about who, how Jesus was. Jesus was fully human in every way. Hebrews 4.15 says Jesus was tempted in every way, without, but without sin. So this is where that image of the balance board comes into play. Um, I took a little bit of issue with how Mary Wiley um, described um, Jesus's experience of humanity. Um, on page 74, she said in the little bar on the side, the God of the universe is for us and understands because he has been there. But that seems like it falls a little too far in saying that Jesus actually needed the experience of being human in order to understand us. Jesus did not need to become human to understand us. He already knew. He already understood us. He created us. He didn't need to come to earth to be a man and be like, oh, this is what it's like. No, that's not, that's not what these verses are saying. Um, we know from last week, God doesn't change and doesn't learn new things. So that's not what these verses are saying. So let's read them again and pick up the context as we look at Hebrews um, starting in um, verse 14. So the children have flesh and since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So those verses don't say, because he knows how it feels to be tempted, he can help you be, get over temptation. It says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. And going back and we look at it, he broke the power of sin and death. So because he broke the power of sin and death, he is able to help those who are being tempted. It's not about learning what it feels like to be tempted. It's about breaking that power. And now we have an open door for that. So you see how hard this is? Like even just one little word can be like, whoops, we're a little too far over here. God doesn't learn things. So I have so much grace for people trying to communicate these things. And I hope you guys feel that. It's not about like, I've got to get all of these words correct. It's about just, we know we're going to fall. We're going we're gonna to not balance things, right? We're going to say things, but God is still God. We don't have to get it all perfectly right. But here, we can start to learn some of those things. We can start to kind of be alert to where the boundaries are. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at where are the boundaries. There's no like pinning it down. We're not going to be able to say, this is it. This is perfect. And this makes all of it make sense. We're kind of just making a, an area that shows us where the boundaries are so that we can say, oh, that's a little too far over there. And when we're, when we're leaning a little too far over here, all of this stuff is going to look hard to understand. But then we go back over here and then, then this stuff looks hard to understand. So we'll just do our best. So moving to that Jesus is fully God, 
Um, how can we know that Jesus is fully God? We can look at the things that Jesus does in scripture. This is called functional Christology. Um, in scripture, we see Jesus doing things that only God can do. So only God is the savior of humanity. Only God can be worshiped. Only Jesus, uh, Jesus is revealing God. Uh, Jesus authority, authoritatively interprets the Torah. Jesus as the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus forgiving sins. Jesus sending the spirit. Only the, these things are all things that only God can do. So as we see Jesus functioning as God, this is functional Christology. The next is title Christology. These are titles that only God has. So we see uh, Jesus given the title of Messiah, son of God, son of man, Lord, savior, God. So we know that Jesus is God because he accepts those titles from others and he uses them of himself. So functions like God, is named like God, so we can, this is how people were saying, yes, Jesus is God. So we see that scripture affirms that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And this is called the hypostatic union, the union of Christ's divine and human natures. So Jesus is a single being with two natures and those two natures move together. Last week, I neglected to mention an important term. It's called perichoresis. This is the idea of a mutual indwelling. If you've ever seen the, I should have put this up, the little triangle thing that kind of is all, um, all swirly um, it, that used to be our church's logo is, uh, is a kind of perichoresis. It's all one thing, but it's in, it's all connected. Um, perichoresis is like the idea of a hug where you and another person are coming together in an embrace, but you even in the embrace, you still are your own people, but now you have become together in an embrace. So, so it's, it, it is that mutual indwelling and interpenetration of each person of the Trinity. In Christology, Perichoresis is the how two natures of Christ come together. Um, so they're, they're not, they're, these two natures are not being enmeshed um, or changed into a new nature, as we'll see, but they are together as one and two. <laughs> Just like the uh, Trinity, together as one as three. So this is a paradox. This is hard to hold. Um, I've in my studies, I have noticed that most of the time when there were heretical beliefs, um, it was because people don't want to hold the paradox and they want, they just want to understand and they're just going to go with it this side. Um, so, and then you let go of the other side, but you have to hold these things in tension. We can't stand the cognitive dissonance. So we try to make something make sense to make ourselves feel better about it. We want resolution. We don't want to live in uncertainty, but we must. And that's why we need faith because we're looking at the things that are unseen. We're looking at the things that don't make sense. Um, and they, but, in, but as we see things from God's eyes, they do make sense. Um, Romans 8, 24 is an encouragement to us for we hope for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes in what they already see. Another verse, um, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not sight. So these things are hard to understand, but they help us to grow in our faith. Um, however, holding this tension doesn't mean that we just throw up our hands and say, well, it's unknowable. So I just, you know, I can't can't really do anything about it. No, we must press in further and recognize that we're going to make a lot of mistakes. Um, others around us are going to make a lot of mistakes. And so our faith is lived out in action. We know that God is big enough to hold all of our mistakes. Uh, so we must give ourselves grace. We must give others grace. Um, our faith is one of those paradoxes. And sometimes we fall on one side or the other. So when we see someone falling on one side or the other, we can speak truth in love. And that is a paradox in itself. How do you speak truth 
but lovingly. Sometimes you can have a little too much truth and not enough love. Sometimes you have a little too much love and not enough truth. That's a paradox as well. And it requires discernment, like we were talking in our small group today. We need to pray and ask God to give us discernment to know exactly how much percentage of truth and love and all of those things to help us understand. This is why emotional health and maturity is really important. Because if we are insecure, we are going to force one thing or the other. But if we are secure in our relationship with Christ and we know down to our bones, it does not, it does not depend on me. I am not the savior of the world. I am not your Holy Spirit. We can speak boldly without fear that we're going to mess it up because we trust that God is going to cover all of that. So it's also important, as I've learned, to know history. Uh, we need to understand theology in its historical context because that helps us clarify our own beliefs and helps us see where we are on the, on the spectrum of things so that we can see which ditch we're closest to falling into. So here are some of the ditches that have been fallen into. Um, Ebionism. I don't know if I'm saying that right now, but that's not the point. It is um, a historical heresy that tended to these, all that I'm going to mention right here are all ones that denied or played down Jesus's divinity. Uh, so Ebenism was a Jewish, Jewish sect that denied Jesus's divinity and the virgin birth. Just that's not possible. Um, adoptionism was that Jesus fundamentally was a human being and he was kind of adopted by God. God kind of bestowed divinity to him, but that denied that in his essence, there was divinity. Um, Arianism, which we talked about last week um, with regards to um, the Trinitarian thought, with regards to Christology, Arianism concluded you cannot split um, into two natures. So if Jesus is... Uh, a human, then he has to be created. So Arianism, that was definitely like Jesus was a creation. That's why in the Nicene Creed, we say not made, not, you know, begotten, not made. Monarchism, um, there were no differentiations within the divine nature. So Jesus is either a normal human being that was adopted into sonship, or he wears a mask of divinity. So we'll talk about that in a minute too. And so all of these heresies fall on the side of denying Jesus's divinity. So too far on the human side. On the other side, there were some that denied his humanity. Uh, Docetism considered that matter is evil. God is not evil, so God can't be matter. Uh, to them, it, seemed, it was that Jesus just seemed to be like a man wasn't actually a man, that was just imaginary. He just appeared kind of like a man. Uh, and then there's Apollinarianism, um, is an incomplete humanity. It affirmed that Jesus took on a body, but not a soul and denied the full humanity of God, of Christ. Um, and this is where I, um, we kind of talked about this in, in our small group. Um, there's a guy named Maximus, and his maxim was that what is not assumed cannot be redeemed. So Jesus took on a full humanity to redeem a full humanity. So if Jesus didn't assume a human nature, he couldn't redeem a human nature. And so I love how somebody put it in our group this morning. It just became so clear that Jesus had to be fully God and had to be fully man in order to uh, save us. Then there were some, we're not just even going side to side here, like human uh, and divine. Now we got to go front and back and all over. There's other dimensions here too, because sometimes people would say, okay, so we got two natures, but like, how do those come together? Um, and some people would say um, they're like totally kind of separate. Um, so Nestorius fell too forward in um, separating the two natures of Jesus um, and divided them out. So they weren't really interacting together. Apollinarianism was so unified that it was basically just one nature. 
Um, so that he struggled to believe in the full humanity of Christ. So just unified it all into one. Uh, and Eutyches had a kind of a different one that these two natures now, um, they kind of join together and make a third new nature. Um, however, that's a problem because as Maximus said, like this is something we can't assume. This is something totally new and different apart from us. Um, we can't participate in that full uh, that third nature because we just have the human nature. So this kind of confused the natures of Christ. In reality, just like the Trinity is one plus one equal uh, plus one equals one, <laughs> Christ is one plus one equals one. So his divine nature and his human nature are 100% and 100% to make 100%. It's complicated. <laughs> it's very hard to kind of put down into words. Um, the word define is taking something that is and making it into words. And God is infinite, so it is hard to define him. We can't lay out the boundaries, but we can kind of get a sense of what's around there. And so we can figure out how to talk about Jesus's natures without nailing it down perfectly. So there's some more creedal words that um, are in the Chalcedonian uh, they say the Chalcedonian definition. So after you have the Nicene Creed, some more things happen, more councils, let's all get together and talk about this. And then with these Nestorius and Apollinarianism and, and some other people talking about how do we talk about this, they're like, no, we need to, we need to set some boundaries here. We need to talk about this. So um, last week we talked about how the Trinity, the word Trinity was created. We also talked about this word, usia, um, and homoousia. Um, so we're going to look a little closer at kind of what those uh, look like. I <laughs> felt like a very big um, Bible history theology nerd when my daughter was like playing her wordle. And she's like, what's a five letter word that has a lot of vowels? And I was like, ousia. <laughs> and I was like, but that's probably not in there. <laughs> um, so uh, ousia is the innermost reality of an entity. It also can be translated substance or essence. Uh, the next one is hypostasis. Um, this is actually was considered a synonym of usia. It, it, it was hard because the, over time, the, the word kind of changed. Um, it was basically interchangeable with usia, but by the fourth century, when they're nailing down these creeds, hypostasis began to be the concrete manifestation of an underlying surface. So that has the idea of person more than essence. So in the Nicene Creed, we saw the Trinity being described as one usia, three hypostases, one nature, three persons. So Christ is one person, um, I'm sorry, one nature in uh, three different, uh, in two different manifestations. Gosh, we're just going to have to edit everything that I say, because I know I'm going to say some stuff wrong in this one. <laughs> I'm, I'm falling all over the place on my balance board here. Uh, so to make this complicated, there's another word that is used called prosopon. Um, and it also means person, but it has the idea of what's being presented as a mask. So a putting on of something. So, so it's obviously now we need to look to Hollywood to help us understand these words. So usia and hypostasis, this is Will Smith. Will Smith is a human being. His entire nature, his usia, is human. You and I also have a human usia. We share that in common with him. We don't share the same usia, but we both have this usia of human. We, our innermost reality is that we are humans. But Will Smith is not just generic human. He is, we experience him as a person who is Will Smith. 
his hypostasis, his personhood, is a man who is Will Smith with his unique talents, with his gifts, with his character, family, interactions. This is his unique um, hypostasis. So his usia is human. His hypostasis is Will Smith. But he also can have a prosopon. This is Will Smith in the movie Men in Black. And he has a prosopon, a mask that he puts on that is um, Agent J. So when he plays this character in the movie, now he has this totally different mask that he's put on. This is the external manifestation of his presence. We are now experiencing him as Agent J. He's still Will Smith, but now he's also Agent J. And in this movie, we experience him someone totally different than Will Smith. And there's no natural uh, relationship between those two hypostases. So putting on a mask, Greek for like a different appearance. Uh, but so here we see, this is one hypostasis, but two different manifestations. So is this what Jesus's nature is like? Did he just put on a human nature? No, no. <laughs> uh, this is not how Jesus's usia operates. Um, it is true that Jesus has one hypostasis. The inner relationship with these two natures is not just putting on a human mask while he was here on earth. So to look more, here we see a case where there's two hypostases and one prosopon. Um, this is how one mask can be filled by two hypostases. In the movie Black Widow, the character of Natasha Romanoff is played by two different actresses. Scarlett Johansson plays the uh, Black Widow as an adult, and Ever Anderson plays her as a youth. So in the movie, Natasha is different ages, but the same person. So there are two people who are combining to create one role. So some people try to describe Jesus's nature like this. It's one Jesus, but two different ways. Um, in different places, in different times, people experience him differently. Um, sometimes you get his divine nature, sometimes you get the human nature, depending on the external appearances. So is this what Jesus's divine nature is like? No, it is not. This is not how Jesus's human nature and divine nature work together. Uh, so how does it work? How does it work? So the Chalcedonian formula was something that was developed to be able to put words down, to put these uh, areas of balance to where um, you can understand Jesus is fully God, fully man. His nature is not divided or separated. It's not so unified that it's one um, indivisible or uh, <laughs> I can't, the other words are just, I'm going to not be able to say the right word. So I'll just read what they put. <laughs> you see that in um, that the same perfect, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is one and the same son, the same perfect in Godhead and the same perfect in manhood, truly God, truly man, the same of a rational soul and body, consubstantial with God, with the father in Godhead the same consubstantial with us in manhood, like us in all things except sin, um, and moving on down to two natures without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. So the difference of the natures being by no means removed because of the, the union. They're unified, but they're not undifferent now, uh, but the property of each nature is preserved and coalescing in one prosopone, one hypostasis, not parted or divided into two prosopo, but one and the same son, only begotten divine word, the Lord Jesus Christ as prophets of old and Jesus Christ himself has taught us about him and the creed of our fathers has been passed down. It is a beautiful wording um, basically saying one plus one equals one. 
But the creed gets pushed back because it's not actually saying anything about positive. It's not saying this is what Jesus is. It's basically just laying out the boundaries of what he's not and how these natures don't come together. Um, so, and that is, <laughs> that is very much um, how these work together. Now, a little history for us. I added this last night and I'm glad I have time to, to um, do this. This is, um, I'll give you a couple of resources that I've been using. One in my um, theology class, this is a book called The True Image and it is all about how uh, Christ's divine and human nature came together in, um, within these creeds and in um, historical theological thought and development. Now, this one I've been using in my uh, uh, church history class, and it's how the, the creeds and the confessions have developed over time um, and um, has a lot of how this, is, this word meant this then and this word meant that then. Um, so it's been really helpful to kind of run through that and understand. This book is one that I have really enjoyed, Christian Women in the Patristic World. Um, because it has really highlighted the role of some of the women involved. And I would love to bring um, one of them to your attention. Her name is Pulcheria. This is her on a coin. Uh, she was uh, the empress of uh, the empire and um, she considers herself a virgin of Christ. At 15 years old, uh, she, uh, her, let's see her, was it 15? I think she, her brother was 10 when he became emperor after their father's death. Um, so she kind of took over while she was 15 um, and kind of helped raise her brother. She taught him all the stuff that she needed to go, basically gave him like emperor classes and told him what he needed to do, how he needed, you know, she helped him to grow up because in the imperial family, it was, it was more of a title um, and the authority of the emperor. And so if there was a weak emperor, other people would step in to support him. And so that's what she did. So Pulcheria was called the protectress of the empire. She also was called the light of orthodoxy for her role in helping the Chalcedonian formula and the Nicene Creed to happen. Um, she is, um, she was a virgin for her life. Um, she did get married at the end, um, but she got married to someone who promised that he would be her husband in name, but they would not, um, uh, they would not consummate their marriage. Uh, she considered herself devoted to Christ. She uh, wanted to be a, um, a virgin of Christ and uh, she held an official position as Augusta in the empire. So there was the emperor and she was considered an Augusta. That was a title. Um, she also, and, and that's an empress title. Um, so let's see, what else did she, what else did she do? I didn't know how much time I would be able to have to, to share all this stuff with you. I really, I was, I was reading about it in one book and I was like, oh, I like her a lot. Uh, because basically these guys, Eutyches, Nestorian, Cyril of Alexandria, all these people were kind of arguing about how we're gonna get this done. There were synods and councils and people getting together. And it seemed like for a while, um, Nestorius was going to win out because he had kind of the ear of some people. And then she came in and, and was able to uh, bring the council to a different location and kind of not invite him. And they all got there late and then it was already decided. So she kind of helped <laughs> some of these things happen um, when it came to the decision about the, um, uh, about the nature of Christ and the council of Chalcedon. Um, what happened was that her brother was kind of on the side of Eutyches, which we talked about the two natures becoming a new nature. And Pulcheria was like, uh, it's not, you know, that is not, I'm trying to influence him. Um, well, he ended up deposing the guy who was kind of his inside source on, on those things. And then he died. And that's why Pulcheria, she was like, well, someone's got to take over. That is why she married this other man, um, Marcion, who would help stabilize the empire. 
So she didn't get married to him because she loved him and wanted to have, you know, marriage. She got married to him very practically because she wanted the empire to be stable. She wanted to make sure to promote this, uh, this doctrine that would show uh, these two natures of Christ coming together, um, not in a new nature. So the council happened. Um, they invited her and clapped for her. They said, the empress believes this. She is the light of orthodoxy and she has helped us. Uh, so I just love reading church history now because I'm like, oh, there are really interesting things that happen. And, and women using their powers of influence uh, to enable uh, and to be a partner with um, other people. So that is, that is uh, hopefully the doctrine of Christ, uh, clear as mud. And if you want to ask some questions, this is, this is my little balance guy. You know, we're balancing all this stuff. I know this is something I've said is totally wrong. So, so let's just ask some questions. Um, and if you're online, you can ask questions in the comments below.